In this episode of On the Run, we'll recap the Fifth Avenue Mile, and Brian Katzenuk will be in the studio to talk about the mystique of the mile. We'll spend some time with Gabe Anderson of Team USA Minnesota in the Twin Cities, and we'll bring you the incredible story of the One Spirit Runners from Pine Ridge, South Dakota. All in this episode of On the Run. Welcome to the National Track and Field Hall of Fame at the Armory in New York City. We are on the run. I'm your host, Carla Bruning. I'm a journalist and a blogger, but I'm also a runner. Every week, we'll bring you profiles, training tips, local heroes, and perspectives on the state of the sport. So stick around. Last week, we were on the run at the Fifth Avenue Mile, a marquee running event right here in New York City where Olympians and world champions take to the streets alongside runners of all ages and abilities. What they all have in common is that one magical mile. Thousands of runners are out here on this beautiful day in New York City to run one of the most storied streets in America. You've heard of the Magic Mile and the Museum Mile, but today we're at the Fifth Avenue Mile, presented by Nissan. We're gonna watch my father run. His name is Edgar Llanos. The whole family's here. We're gonna watch him cheer on him on. We're here at the finish of the men's 30 to 34 heat. How was your race today? Actually, it was spectacular. I've been injured forever. And I didn't get to build up to this like I normally want to, so. And uh, my teammates won the last couple years in a row. He bumped up an age group, so. I'd rather beat him head on, but I'm glad to get it. <laughs> How was your race today? It was awesome. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I thought that, you know, I was in the category before. I forgot that I just turned 50 on Monday. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> I'm here with Bert Robbins, who is out to break a world record today in the Fifth Avenue Mile. <laughs> How was your race, Bert? Not, not quite. Uh, uh, my race was okay. I, I ran into an injury two, three weeks ago, so I couldn't do any training. So my wind was a little bit off. Happy, happy to have reach the finish line. Thank you. How was your race today? It was good. It was good. It's a lot of fun. You try and beat your time every single year. I think I might have done it. Might have set my PR. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. New York Roadrunners President and CEO Mary Wittenberg who just ran the Fifth Avenue Mile herself. How was your race? Great. I love that Fifth Avenue Mile. I gotta say, you know, for many years the mile was so intimidating and it was all about running really fast, and we're trying to break that down at New York Roadrunners. Even I used to be intimidated by the mile, and then I was here and said, why not? And I started running it. And it's so much fun for everybody because just push to your own personal best. It doesn't matter that you don't win the race. So it's really, really fun. I love it. In the women's field, Brenda Martinez broke the tape and became the 2012 Fifth Avenue Mile Champion. While the men's pro race was stacked with the world's best athletes, it was Centrowitz who broke the tape for the win. Lagat finished second and Leo Manzano took third. It was an amazing day for all the runners who competed, but one runner in particular has a truly inspirational story. Gabe Anderson narrowly missed out on a spot on the U.S. Olympic team with a fourth place finish at the trials, but she's won much larger victories. I'm Gabrielle Anderson. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm a professional runner for Team USA Minnesota and Brooks. Well, there's definitely a lot of different things that go into being a successful professional runner, but um, my journey has been a little bit unique. I 
had some bumps in my career and just in life. I, when I was a fifth year senior at Minnesota, I ended up finding a lump on my neck and being diagnosed with a salivary gland cancer and had radiation treatment for about 10 weeks that summer and then was also diagnosed with a thyroid cancer in my neck. It was, um, it was definitely tough to have to deal with that twice. It's been something that's challenged me a lot as a person and as an athlete, but I do think that the mentality of a runner is something that's helped me along the way. I think that that mentality really helped me to get through my treatments and try to stay strong and really hope that there could be a better future for me after having gone through this. 2012 was a good year for me. I was looking forward to the, the Olympic year. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I, I thought I might have a shot at making the team if I put some good performances together. I ended up just missing the team, but also running a PR a few weeks later and having some personal bests at other events, so it was a, it was a good season overall. I think it just has gone to, a long way to show me the type of person that I am, that you know things might not go in my favor all the time, but definitely trying to just be a fighter and just do my best every day and also just I've learned that I do love running and that it was definitely worth the struggles that I've overcome to to live the dream that I'm living today. <laughs> New York is very different than uh, the small town I'm from in Minnesota. The first time that I came to New York City was for the mile two years ago and I had, was coming off an NCAA season. I was not sure what to expect at this race but you know, you put on your game face when you're in New York, and there's some awesome runners here, tons of Olympians. Um, it's, you can't match the atmosphere of New York City. When you have devastating news or some tough adversity to go through, I think at first it's really hard to believe that there's a happy future for you. So, you know, just because today is a tough day doesn't mean tomorrow has to be the same, and I think that's one of the most important things that I had to learn throughout this journey is just that keeping that positive attitude, it can change everything. We're here with Brian Kasanov, Olympic writer for Sports Illustrated, to talk about the mystique of the mile. Thank you for joining us, Brian. Good to be here. Now, when we talk about running, there are sort of three iconic distances that people think about. The 100 meters, the marathon, and the mile. What is it about the mile that has been so enduring? You know, I think it's a few things. One is there's a certain symmetry to it. In people's minds, it's a minute times four. Pretty easy to understand. It's also something that people have for the most part, tried to do at some point in their lives. I mean, everybody can sprint 100 meters. Not everybody, when they're growing up, can run a mile. It's like the first test that they actually do. And it also cuts the difference between the frenetic nature of the sprint and the enduring you know, saga of the marathon. It's something in between with a lot of pace to it, a lot of uh, sort of chess moves to it, and uh, a lot of strategy and even a little bit of luck to it. If you get boxed in, you know, luck comes into play. So I think it brings all those elements together, and it's also not too long for people to watch. People can get glued to something for roughly four minutes. Asking them to be glued to something for two hours might be a little hard. Expecting them to understand the nuance of 10 seconds might be hard. But four minutes is pretty easy for people to grasp. And do you think it's ingrained in our culture because of our history with it? Or is it nostalgia? What is it that keeps attracting us to this it, It's a little bit of both. I mean, especially for people who followed the indoor miles for, for so many years. There was, and, and perhaps still is, people leaning, you know, holding on to it, a bit of nostalgia. Um, but I also think, especially for the people in North America and, of course, the people in, in Great Britain, uh, there's been a great history of people trying to, uh, you know, get over that next hump to, to run four minutes um, not just Roger Bannister, but really this is a race that endured even after he, he broke that particular barrier. So I think for us, when we say the mile, you ask people in running, but you ask people on the streets about the mile, it registers, it resonates. And uh, I, don't, I, I don't necessarily see that changing. It's a demarcation point for people. And for runners, you know, uh, it's a great challenge. Most of the rest of the world yeah. thinks in terms of meters. Mm -hmm. Is it important to the sport to keep running the 1500 and the mile? 
That's a great question. Um, I would say it's the $1,500 question. How about that? Um, it, there is a link to the past, which I think is healthy. And there's no greater link to the past in our sport than the mile. It is not a link that the entire world shares as much as we do. So realistically, uh, they are going to run 1,500 meters in Europe. They're going to run them in Asia. They're going to run them in the Olympic Games. There is a certain symmetry, however, to the mile that no other non-metric race has. It's simple, it's easy to understand, and because of the history of it, it's an anomaly in the sport. Well, Amazon right now has commercials out where they um, compare one of their achievements with the four-minute mile. Mm. Do you think that people will still be talking about it in another 20 years, another 30 years? You know, it, it, it's very interesting because that mile took place half a century ago, and yet people still say this achievement fill in the achievement, fill in the blank, is like the four-minute mile. They don't say it's like the three-minute, 30-second, 1,500 meters. They don't say it's like uh, the two-hour and 10-minute or five-minute uh, marathon. Eventually, we may be talking about the two-hour marathon. But it is uh, a focal point. It's a basis for comparison for other achievements and milestones that has endured for an awfully long time, and I don't see that changing. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Brian. I think that the mile is one of those distances that will always be in the forefront of the runner's imagination. Well, thanks. It's been a great discussion, and now I need to go out and run one right now. Our local hero this week is Sid Howard. He's a Team for Kids coach and at the age of 73 recently won his 48th Masters National Championship. His passion and enthusiasm for running is infectious. Simply, to know Sid is to love Sid. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to say it one more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, I like that much better. The name is Sid Howard. I'm actually 73 years old, and I like to be known as ambassador to Masters Track and Field. I've been running for 34 years. I have 48 national titles, eight world titles, and four world records. What motivates me to run is the fact that I can actually run. I can run and enjoy it. Today we are at Tilden Senior Center. We are here every Wednesday to uh, have exercise as well as healthy living tips and walking to the seniors here. The senior community is not given a, a lot of attention. A lot of seniors just live for today. They have no idea that if they did any type of movement, that it would benefit them. Even if they only move their bodies twice a week. And we also try to encourage them that if any type of exercise would definitely help with avoiding memory loss as well as Alzheimer's. We have over 30, sometimes 35 and 40 seniors that they are really excited with the program. They lost weight, they are more energized, and in fact, they have somewhere to come and not only eat, but to do exercise at the same time. The Fifth Avenue Mile is going to be my 30th uh, Fifth Avenue Mile, and when we first started in 1983, I ran my first race, and I think my first race, I came in fifth place, and I gave everybody uh, some type of uh, award. I, I, I don't know how I was able to do it, but I'm just happy that I'm able to click off each year and still be able to meet this, the requirements of the Fifth Avenue Mile to run 20 blocks. That's all I need to do. I enjoy the fact that I don't need it to do anything but put on a pair of running shoes and go out and enjoy it. Oh my brother, that was that was work. 615, 73 years old. But I'm happy to, to have a finish like I did. I thought it was over for me, but I'm glad I was able to put something in at the end.
And now we go to Pine Ridge, South Dakota, where a group of young Native Americans are preparing to run the ING New York City Marathon. Like all the 48,000 runners who will be towing the line in November, they've worked incredibly hard to get there. But where they come from and what they've overcome is as unique as it is amazing. If you understand a horse, when you run with them, you feel something with them, a spirit. In the Indian wake, they've always been running. Running's in our blood. You can feel it, it's, it's part of our culture. We used to have to run to tribe to tribe, and that was like 30 miles, 50 miles apart. That was just to send a message and come back. I'm Alex Wilson from Pioneer, South Dakota. I'm 24 years old, member of the Ogla Sioux Tribe, three-time state champion. Crazy Horse, Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, all that history revolves around the Lakota people. Living down here is not too many jobs. There's not a whole lot to do. The things that happen around Pine Ridge and the suicides and deaths and everything, and the drinking and stuff, it's really different from anywhere else. Our tribe has its struggles. I think every place does. We know there's a better side to this great Lakota nation than alcoholism, gangs, and all that stuff. One thing is, you know, the fight of the people. Um, you know, everyone kind of goes down swinging and it's never a defeat. It's, you know, what can we do next? Well, last spring, I was contacted by one spirit nonprofit group and just does positive things for the reservation. Uh, they wanted to know if I would try to help coach some marathon runners. We're trying to make a dream happen. We're trying to get a youth center for our district. Our children have nowhere to go. The housings were built with no sidewalks. So our children have to walk in the streets. And we have to start somewhere to help give our youth hope. And at the same time, we're trying to heal our community. They wanted to find some runners to um, run the New York City Marathon. I and mean, the whole deal is we're trying to raise money to build a building for youth in Allen. So good runners were chosen to uh, be the ambassadors of our nation. My name is Amanda Carlo, born and raised on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Last year, one of my co-workers said, let's run a half marathon. I was like, yeah, let's do it. It kind of lit a fire under me, and now I just want to keep running. A lot of people think of it as just like this dumping ground, but I love it here. Like the culture, um, the language, the, just the spirit of this place is beautiful, and I love it, and I'm you know, proud to say that I come from here because it makes me a strong person in who I am. My name is Kelsey Goodlance, 21 years old. I've been running throughout my whole life, but didn't really take it serious till my junior and my senior year in high school. I was placed in top 10 at every meet. Went to state, qualified for state. It was best experience. Found out they were looking for runners to run in the New York Marathon, and I just, I was looking, hoping for an opportunity like this to motivate me to keep me running. And when I saw the ad in our, our local newspaper, I was like, hey, this is something I, I need it for me. Well, today we are gonna run down the number four dirt road, heading up to the graveyard where my sister's buried, and it's just about a good four miles here. She died from suicide, and gives me a lot of reason to run, and I feel myself every day, well, I only have so little time to train, but at the same time, it's, it's, in, it's in my heart, so I'm gonna do it. And that's why I tell myself I'm gonna finish the race. That's what I want. It would make me really proud to see our Lakota youth in the New York Marathon. A long time ago, I think it was 1964, a man named Billy Mills he was from right here, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. He won the 10K in the Olympics. 
I kind of think this is some probably as exciting as that. It's going to be exciting, a little scary, a little nervous, but it's going to be fun. Lots of people, big things. <laughs> nervous. The only hope for our people is to bring back some of the old ways and the old, old respect and honor that we had for our people and each other. You have to make the young people understand why they're running, what's behind it. Good luck uh, on this last month of preparations. Some of these guys have been preparing, you know, good six months now in the New York Marathon. I think it's really cool just like being able to be like a positive representation of the tribe. I've been waiting for something like this to happen and where the kids are making an impact. Whatever dream in life you have can come true. I have people ask me, what are you running for? And I'm like, I'm running for you guys. The One Spirit Runners are truly incredible. For more information about them, visit nativeprogress.org. Every runner wants to get better. Training tips and on the run are here to help. This week we have two-time Olympians Pascal Dobert and Matt Tegenkamp who are here to help you find your edge. My name is Pascal Dobert and I am the strength coach and assistant track coach with the Oregon Track Club in Portland. I'm an Oregon Track Club athlete, Matthew Tegenkamp. And today I will go through some very simple, basic core strengthening routines that you can do anywhere and anytime with no equipment, all you'll need is your body and um, some space. Okay, we're gonna start off with some balance work. The first thing he's gonna do is he's gonna take his outside leg, turn his toe slightly in, and he's gonna just go out and in. I have our guys do 10 of these, and then the next one he's gonna do is gonna start off in front and then move his leg back, slight dip in the knee on the way back, and then forward again. Like I said, we have 10 of these with the guys, but we'll just do five with Matt. And then we do some holding exercises. So he'll just bring his leg out front and hold it there for five seconds, and then out to the side for five, and then behind him for five. And again, he's using his backside muscles, he's using his core to stabilize his pelvis and his spine. So this movement has kind of three parts to it, okay? The first part is a squat down, Second part is the reach, and then come back in and up. I would recommend starting off with five if you've never done this kind of work before, and slowly progress your way up to 10. Nice workout, buddy. Solid. That's our show for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget to tune in every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. for more of Life on the Run. You can also watch all of these segments on demand at nyrr.org. We'll see you on the run.